Here we go again, students. This is Dr. Winkler again. This is lecture 16 of the World War I class. As you probably remember from last time, I was talking about the soldier's experience in the trenches. <clears throat> what was it really like to fight this war? And I tried to give you an, an explanation as to how the men felt. One of the ways that I could do this was by referring to war songs, British war songs, that were sung by the men in the trenches during the war. <clears throat> I floundered around a little bit, got a little confused, didn't find exactly what I was looking for. Remember, I wanted you to hear part of, this, part of the song, I Don't Want to Be a Soldier. And remember, I showed you one of the refrains here, send out me, be, <laughs> can't read this morning, send out me brother, me sister, and me mother. But for God's sake, don't send me. Let's actually sing it for you, okay? It's a fun song. Uh, I urge you to come back and play this again if you would like. I just wanted to show you what the men were actually saying. And remember, talking about they want to be at home, they don't want to get killed, uh, they don't want to be shot, they don't have a band in their back. Send everybody up, don't send me. Okay, talked a little bit about Remark last time. Very important author, very important book. And remember, I went into some detail as to the nature of the book itself. It's very important. It opens your eyes in many respects. But please don't take it as an account. Please take it as fiction. There are things there, that, as I mentioned last time, that are really kind of stupid. Also, and, and it still sits very, very poorly upon me to see how badly he insulted the medical profession. Were they perfect? I don't think so. But they are the one really bright shining light of the, men, of the men's experience. They were overworked. The, the conditions were terrible. They did the best they could. And they saved a lot of lives in their effort. Well, let's take a look at the fighting. That's what we're talking about here. What's really like for the men? I refer to this already in a couple of contexts when we're talking about snipers. Remember, you go back to the, when we're talking, discussing the Mauser rifle and the variants used by various nationalities. These are such good weapons at such long range. You don't really have special snipers rifles in the First World War because the regular infantry rifle is very accurate at very long distances. The real difference is that when you're using a rifle as a sniper rifle, you put a scope on it. Therefore, you're more accurate. Sometimes this kind of thing can be really cat and mouse. You, uh, <clears throat> and sometimes there's duels between snipers where you lurk around, can't put your head up very long. If you do, you'll be killed. Lurk around, see if you can see your enemy give himself away and uh, get in a shot before they 
recover or do something else. Uh, they had what we call blinds. You'd have a slit, and sometimes they, they'd have these metal sheets, and the metal sheets would just have a small slit. It's enough for you to see through. It's enough for you to stick a rifle through and aim. But unless your enemy is good enough, and at several hundred yards, probably nobody's this good. You see, even if you are that good at that kind of distance, there can be something a little bit off in the bullet itself. Uh, the amount of powder, the number of grains in the, in the shell can, can vary quite considerably. Um, I shouldn't say quite considerably. It can vary somewhat. Uh, and at several hundred yards, uh, a small variance can, can make a lot of difference. And uh, though these weapons are very finely tuned, they're not going to be perfect at, at long distances because at some distance, if they're off even a slight amount, you can miss by a number of inches. <clears throat> so usually these slits work fairly well. The Germans tend to have a very good reputation as snipers. I'm not exactly sure why, why this is. I do know, however, at the beginning of the war, particularly the beginning of the war, the German optics industry is more advanced than it is in other countries. Since this is such a, a technical kind of thing, this is a hard industry to ratchet up quickly. At the beginning of the war, the British realized they've got to have binoculars for their officers. And they have very few binoculars, and it's very hard to ratchet this up. Yeah, you send your orders back to the United States, but the United States optical industry is not as robust as it is in other countries. <clears throat> so there's an arrangement, I forget, was it 35,000 pairs of binoculars that going through Switzerland and <clears throat> that the British are able to trade, to trade for from the Germans themselves. It's kind of interesting trading with your enemy. Of course, if the Germans want to give you something as valuable as binoculars, there's a pretty good idea that they want something in return. The accounts I read said that we're unsure exactly what the, what the uh, Germans got for this. Uh, some people say, well, well, why did the Germans really need it? They really couldn't get Well, things like rubber. So they're speculating a little bit. I'm going to argue that perhaps one of the reasons why the snipers, in the early part of the war particularly, actually throughout the war, have such a good reputation, at least initially in the war, they had more scopes. And more scopes mean more accuracy. I was talking to you just a minute ago about duels. <clears throat> there's, there's a man I know. He's a, he's a retired professor. His name's Montgomery, <clears throat> retired history professor. And, and he tells a story about his grandfather. Now, his, apparently his family was Canadian. Uh, I remember when I first heard the story, I said, well, if he's from Utah, uh, there's a book called Utah and the Great War, where it lists the names of every known Utah that was killed in the First World War. Give me the name. I can go look it up and see what happened to the guy. Well, apparently he was a Canadian, so I don't know where to look to find whatever detail I can. In any event, the story was this. It's his cat and mouse thing. You're trying to, trying to figure out how to take out a sniper. His grandfather's involved in this. And his, he finally figured out, he finally got a guy, and he finally took a shot. And even at long distance, you can see hair fly up and helmet come flying off. He got him. And in just one second, in, in exuberation, he celebrated. He jumped up or something. And bam! A sniper took him out. You see, he thought he was after one sniper, but he was after two. Now, you have to be careful about family stories. If you have an account by a man who was there, that's very reliable. When things are passed down for, for a couple of generations, you do have to be careful. On the other hand, this is the kinds of things that did go on. You have to be enormously careful if you're in the trenches, not to show anything. Of course, once in a while, you're going to have to look. You're going to have to look out. Remember, if you do have a periscope, that saves you an awful lot of potential danger. But you've got a man on the firing line. If something happens out there, you've got to know it. One of the survival tactics that the men talked about in the trenches, and you do have to look out, 
And one of the things that you do never want to do is look up at the same point, at the same place. At uh, again, okay, I glanced up here, got down before it could hit me. Do not glance the same place again. Very dangerous. You better put it your head up another place else, because if he's watching for you, he might already have that position, your position, your head sided in, and you simply take that down and you, pop, and you're gone. You can't take those kind of risks. I have another sniper story. <clears throat> My mother is from Fairview, Utah. And during the First World War, uh, there were a number of men from Fairview, Utah, among other communities in Utah that served in the military. Well, every year at Memorial Day, uh, I'd go down with mom, this for many, just decades, many years. We would go down to Fairview. And we would decorate the grave of my grandmother, who died in 1967, and my uncle Ross, who died like in 1921. He was a small child when he died. My mother was born in 1917, so she's a little bit older. So she did remember him. When the rest of the family, the older people were gone, she was the only one of the siblings that still remembered the one brother. Anyway, we go down to decorate the graves. Nearby, nearby where the graves is in the Fairview Cemetery, there's a grave of a man who was killed in the First World War. We would go with my grandpa. You see, he lived to be 97. This guy refuses to die. He was born in 1892. Let me tell you a story about, about him. Funny man, like to tell stories. When the war broke out, 19, he, that grandpa would have been, what, 26 years old. Uh, very, very prime military age. Now, he was married in 1916. So when the draft came out in 1917, he's in a lower category because he's married. They had my mother in October 1917. So he's in another category. So they never got around to drafting him, is my point. And he said he was talking, told me he was talking to his grandma. And he's, and <clears throat> should I clean this up for you or give it to you straight? Uh, his grandmother said to him, I'd rather crawl under the bed and crack cat shit before I would enlist. Of course, Grandpa tells the story, so he's funny, and he was all blushing at the time because Grandma apparently wasn't, his Grandma wasn't pretty that earthy. Uh, but there's a lot of people in Utah didn't think much of the federal government. There's a lot of people in Utah didn't think much of the war. Though Utahns did serve in very large numbers. And, uh, what, 270, something like that were killed. Well, <clears throat> when Grandpa died, you know, 97, <clears throat> he's one of these guys who kind of overlived himself. <clears throat> and Mom was... A little bit, you know, she says, this is an end of a generation and going on, that kind of thing. Uh, I try to be a decent human being, but once in a while I'm a little callous. And in this case, I, I was a little callous. Because I said, look, if he had been born in Europe in 1892, he would have died unmourned and unloved in the mud someplace in France. Long life, big family, you know, huge number of grandkids, great grandkids by the time he died. He died in a hospital wearing clean sheets and in a pretty nice situation. Well, America was lucky. We didn't have to pay the enormous price of the war. We'll talk about the American involvement later. Let's go back to the cemetery. Let's go back to the Fairview Cemetery. There was a man buried in there. Now, at the end of the war, the Americans, if you lost a loved one in the war, had a choice. You could leave the men in France, and there are huge cemeteries. Biggest cemetery, U.S. cemetery in Europe, happens to be a World War I cemetery, which I visited. I can mention that to you later. Or you could get the government, a government expense. They'll bring them home. So some of the Utahns and other Americans, 
that were killed in France are buried in Utah and other states. So the man, the man who was killed in the First World War, was buried close to my grandmother and my uncle. Of course, I asked my grandpa, do you remember him? Oh, yeah, sure. These are small towns. Everybody knew everybody. So sure I remember him. So, Grandpa, what happened? Now, I'm not sure Grandpa had it straight, but this is something that certainly could have happened. He said, oh, he was out there and he had to look around. He didn't, he wasn't there as much as a week before he had to, he had to look. And he raised his head up and, well, a sniper got him. That was it. Now, of course, this is Memorial Day. So people still come over to visit the cemetery. There was a man. Mom knew him well. My grandpa liked him. Called him Bishop. Who had come and visit his father's grave. When this man left to go to France, his mother, his wife, I said that wrong, his wife didn't even know she was pregnant. But she was pregnant. Of course, her husband's killed. And her son was there, and he still didn't fear of you. So at exactly the same time, that we're visiting Uncle Ross and, and Grandma's grave. This man is visiting his father's grave because he killed in the First World War. Of course, he was born after the man he died. He didn't even know anything about him, really, not personally. And, and you know, another incident of me saying stupid things. He's looking at his father's grave. I came over and I said, your father died in the First World War. He says, yeah. And, and I said, well, you must be proud of him. It becomes very challenging when you ask people a question when you give them the answer in the question. Sure, I. He slumped. He went and said, Yes. Well, what else is he going to say? I told him what to say. I wonder if body language tells you anything, he was not terribly happy that he lost his father in this war. Sniper got him. Cat and mouse games. Very challenging. As I continue with the discussion of the human experience on the Western Front, let me say something about the military experience. Now, remember, I was in the Navy Reserves, never deployed in combat, <clears throat> never saw a shot fired in anger. Yeah, we went down to the gun range and plugged away the pistols a few times. It was kind of fun, actually. But as far as going to war, I never had that experience. But it is my opinion that one of the most awful of all human experiences is to, do, is to be deployed in a rifle company wartime. Now, you can be in the military, you can do a lot of different things. But actually being in a rifle company means you're in combat, means you're up front. That is one of the most horrific of all possible human experiences, in my opinion. Talk a little bit about the accoutrements. Before the uh, early parts of the war, nobody has adequate, has an adequate head protection. Remember I showed you uh, uniforms at the early part of the war. This would include, remember I showed you the French? Pretty flashy kind of dudes, right? Uh, their, their head, their headgear in the first part of the war is, is a cap. Now, the Germans have a, and sometimes we look at that and we say that it is a helmet of sorts. Well, actually, it's the pickle halba. It's the spiked helmet. And I can't show you one there, so I'll show you a spiked helmet here. Uh, this is for an officer. This is decoration. <clears throat> you can buy it on eBay for 1500 bucks. Well, I don't why, I see I can pass up on that, but I'll half use restraint and not buy it. The uh, initial ones, I'd like to show you early in the war, kind of hard to see what's going on, but they're made of the leather. N now, why leather? Well, if you're fighting a cavalry man, he comes slashing with a sword. The leather will help a little bit. And I'm sure leather will help a little bit when it comes to shrapnel. But for real protection, even the Germans have something, but it's not good enough. When the men particularly are standing in the trenches, 
and there's shell fire going over, including shrapnel coming down. One of your most vulnerable places, of course, is your head. Head wounds have a tendency to be very debilitating. I mean, if you take if you take a wound in your back, take a wound in your legs, that's terribly painful. It can kill you. But a head wound will, will be more likely to be lethal than anything else and more likely to have lasting effects. So both, all sides realized by the end of 1914, well, we've got to have some kind of head protection. Now, a question I would like to ask as we go into this discussion of head protection is why not body armor? Body armor had been around since the Middle Ages. Actually, the Romans used body armor. The Greeks used body armor. It literally goes back thousands of years. Can't you have something here that might deflect a shell? You do see this at times in the First World War. You'll see German soldiers with some kind of body armor. Uh, this was not commonly issued to people. In fact, what it was, was just something for to stand, stand around for ceremonial purposes. Like you're standing in front of a general's command post, you have some of this. It was not commonly issued. When it was, when you started using body armor, largely in the Korean War, there were flak jackets during the Second World War. You're up in an aircraft, and because the aircraft can't hold you up, you can have some kind of body armor on, call them flak jackets. So when the enemy exploding shells nearby and it goes through the wall of the aircraft, it doesn't necessarily it does protect you somewhat. It's big, it's bulky, it's heavy. When you start to have more advanced forms of body armor, like during the Korean War, it was first issued. Sometimes it was first issued and men were fighting in the hills, those awful hills of Korea. And they brought these, <clears throat> the armor to you. I shouldn't call it armor. It's, it's actually bulletproof vests and bulletproof pants. And of course, the men are wearing helmets at that time. And they initially issued these to the guys uh, to kind of see if you could operate and walk around and and then they came back. Remember, this is for practice purposes, just to find out what's happening. When they came back and asked the guys to remove them, they didn't want them. Please, can we keep them? So this is very common. This is what we see in wars. Well, we really hear more, more about it in the Vietnam War because it was kind of in its infancy. In 1968, 67, 68, the Marines are fighting at Quezon. This is a fortress in the hills overlooking the Ho Chi Minh Trail. There were some battles for the hills nearby, 881 North, 881 South, yeah, those kind of things. They, they name hills over, name hills by the, their height in meters. This is also done in the First World War. Any event, one of the accounts I read, there, there is an American Marine, he's involved in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Vietnamese. And, you know, it's, it's a pretty close kind of thing, which one buddy really tried to to help him. But how are you going to do this, right? Uh, he just took his M16. He shoved it between the two men and let it rip. Since the Marine was wearing protection, he wasn't hurt. But it blew the Vietnamese to shreds, cut him up. Any event, I'm getting off the topic here, aren't I? Starting late 1914 into 1915, the army started to issue helmets. They issue helmets all over the place. So by 1916, it takes a little while, got to get your industry, got to produce millions of these things and get them out to the front. So by 1916, we are now, everybody has helmets. Let's take a look at a look at some of these. One of the ways you can tell a German World War I helmet from a World War II helmet, the configuration is, is very, very similar, but there is a difference. This is a World War I helmet. How can I tell? Notice the bolts right here. If you're into late night scary movies, you see that the Frankenstein's monster, 
who, who really got his jump in life, his start in life by electrodes. So electrodes on the neck. Um, looks a little bit eerie from that standpoint. On the other hand, this is not for electrodes. What this will do for you is a place to anchor a shield. Now, these things are not redesigned to stop a bullet. What they're designed to do is to stop, stop shrapnel from coming down. Since shrapnel is round, it doesn't really have as much penetrating power. And its velocity will be less from an explosion rather than coming out of a rifle fire. <clears throat> this is usually very adequate for your purposes. I have, for your viewing pleasure, a world, well, I call it a World War I helmet. I bought it on the internet. I think I got it on eBay. I'm trying to remember the price. The price was reasonable, I thought, you know, 20, 30 bucks. But after you get paying shipping and handling, it's like another 20, 20, 25 dollars. Um, I just, strange thing for old guys. I wanted, because I wanted it. I get an idea of how heavy it is. Usually the British helmets, Weight about two pounds. Since the Germans are using metrics, their helmets tend to weigh one kilogram, in other words, 2.2 pounds. So, so they're a little bit heavier. <clears throat> Some of these, I think, since I bought this from an American location, it's probably an American helmet. It's probably also not a World War I helmet because there'd be a lot more helmets that the United States had, which they issued later. At the first part of the Second World War, the Americans were still using this kind of helmet. Now, if I were walking around with this thing, I think it'd be a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, it's very old over the years. The liner has essentially gone to the point where I cannot expand it. So I cannot expand it so it actually fit my head. But if I could, it would fit my head. And I have a fairly large hat size. If you really want to look like a geek, <laughs> or some kind of dork, you can walk around like this. One time I had this in my office and the fire alarm went off and I got to be goofy. And the fire alarm was, was a false alarm. So we all went back to our offices. But I had a meeting right after that and I walked in wearing this saying, I'm ready for all emergencies. Didn't get one laugh. Well, give you an idea of what they're like. Remember, if they have a bolt on them, they're a World War I helmet. And the reason why you have the bolt on this, and I had it back here. You have an example. You got the bolt right here. And this is heavy metal. This is thick. This is like a couple inches thick. And notice this man has a slit when it's down, as you can see. You can see right here. In other words, if you're a sniper and uh, you're wearing one of these things, yeah, it'll, it'll deflect a bullet, bing, bing. But a bullet coming straight in is probably going to go through this and kill you. But if you have this heavy metal to protect your face, and you have your sniper out here, um, and that, that's enough to stop a bullet, man, that is a big advantage. So anyway, that's why you see bolts. In World War II, the configuration of the German helmet is very, very similar. But they don't have the bolts. So that's, that's the best way you can really tell. Best way you can tell the difference. Now, usually when these things were constructed, they were constructed with a metal press. In other words, you have your metal right here, and then you have a device that presses them up to make the form. When you have that kind of thing, okay, when you have that kind of thing, you've got a, you've got a different problem. Because then the, mo the, the key part of the area right here on top will tend to be thinner metal. And that's where you need the most protection when the shrapnel comes down and hits you. Let's go to a French helmet from World War I. Notice they are somewhat different. Now the French, the Italians, and Belgians all have helmets that are similar in configuration. I, I you know, this, this guy looks kind of stylish right here. Um, you would look at these kind of things and say, oh, well, it's pretty good style. But notice what we have is on the top of this, you see 
a, what would you call that, a ridge line? When they manufactured these things, and you press the metal up here, remember it's thinner on the top. You can have it thinner and run a big risk, or you can just simply put on another piece of metal, which is going to help defend the crown of the head. So people, people are, are wearing, wearing these things. I do not own a French or German. I was going to buy a World War I German helmet. You know what they cost? Oh boy. <clears throat> little out, out of reach for something I'm going to look at every now and again. French helmets are also a little bit too, too pricey for my meager taste, but I'm, do, I'm, I'm glad that I have one. When I saw one of these once, I got to handle it. It was so light. I'm going, is this the helmet liner? And then I was told, no, no, this is actually a helmet. I don't know what they weighed. <clears throat> and maybe I got one that was issued, shall we say, a little prematurely or something like that. But I thought it was so light, it was almost flimsy. The Germans actually do have the reputation for having the best helmet in the First World War. They don't have the same kind of problems with the metallurgy. <clears throat> They're more advanced in, in their manufacturing processes. So when they punch these out, they really don't have as much thinness up here, which you see in other helmets, in other armies. <clears throat> and the coverage, essential coverage on your head is the best. Now, you look at this kind of thing and go, well, look, I'm hanging around this kind of thing. And if I'm in a trench, you say, well, if I'm out running and I fall down, better yet, I hit the dirt. Is this going to cover my head? Well, it's probably going to slop forward. I guess if it ended up like this, it could cover the back of my head a little bit. But can we say it's pretty awkward as far as, as actually running out in combat situation? Standing in a trench, one of the reasons why I have a brim out here, is to have an explosion over here. This will at least protect part of my head and part of my face. But the Germans are actually better. This comes down around the head and the neck. You have a slight area, area out here. So it even shed the rain a little bit. It doesn't come into your face quite as easily. One of the reasons why I'm saying that it has a reputation for being such a good, such a good helmet is that what does the modern U.S. military helmet look like? They call these things the Fritz. You see, this is the. We even have a comparison right here. See if that works. We have a modern American helmet, which is not identical, but it has a lot more similarities between the German helmet than they do than you do <clears throat> the other British and French helmets that were used during the First World War. I'd like to show you the back of this, but I shouldn't spend too much time here. Once again, you, you do see some of the similarities. That is a World War I helmet, as I've already explained. I was downstairs poking around finding some memorabilia. I pulled up some of the, some World War I era shells. That, and remember, I was telling, talking to you earlier, and I'm not sure I'm showing you this well. Maybe you can't see it at all. Probably not. This has a soft tip. This is a dum-dum. In other words, this is illegal. This is also a dum-dum because it's also illegal because it has a soft tip. The reason why I want to show you these things is that the Russian, can you see that a little bit? The Russian, this is the Russian, I have a Russian rifle. The Russian rifle here is using a smaller round. Now that's still lethal, still just as lethal. Why would the Russians have a smaller round? Probably because it saves you some metal. Any event, oh, just by the by, probably can't see this either. Now it has a little bit of red around the bottom here. That means it's a tracer. Uh, it's a World War I kind of tracer. Dad said when he was in the Army during the Second World War that the every fifth round on a machine gun would be a tracer so you can see where the rounds are going. Okay. Uh, one thing that comes into its own and into big use <clears throat> during the First World War is the hand grenade. 
Now we can go back and read military history going back a long time. And there's a group of people we call grenadiers, which means grenaders. The idea of going way back when to the American Revolution and much earlier as well. You had what we call shock troops, men that are ahead of everybody else. And the idea was they were supposed to run next to your enemy and they were supposed to throw a hand bomb, the grenade, so to the hand bomb into your enemy. Well, the hand bombs, the grenades had a tendency to be, leave a lot to be desired. What kind of timing mechanism are you going to use? They actually explode, do the appropriate amount of damage. Sometimes the fuses on them are improper, blow up in your hand. So actually, we usually talk about grenadiers, not as men out throwing grenades, but as men that are, that are actually some of your elite troops, the grenadiers. Well, let's take a look at some of the grenades. Early in the war, it was realized that in trench warfare, grenades are very helpful. If you can get within throwing range, creep out in no man's land, or if you're assaulting an enemy position, if you can get within throwing range, a grenade is fantastic. You know, you throw it, it has an arch on it, ideal for landing in a trench and blowing it up. Obviously, if you're close enough to throw, you're close enough to see what you're throwing at, and you've got a good arm, you can drop it exactly where you want. So it's very, very helpful. It's almost an ideal infantry weapon as far as getting close in the trenches are concerned. Uh, first part of the war, I'm talking about the British in this case, they were supposed to make bombs by hand. What you would do is you simply walk around the trench, and of course there's some shrapnel laying around always, <clears throat> pieces and shards of metal and glass, which you can pick up, and you take your explosive gunpowder, and you essentially put it in a small case, and you put these little shards of metal around it. And then you have a fuse, essentially just some powder in a cord coming off. And when you light it, it burns down and then you, then you toss it over. Well, you can see the problems with this. Uh, is it going to be effective? It could be. Um, is it going to go off too early? The British Army kept on coming down changing their stipulations on what you do. You will count to four before you throw that grenade. So the enemy either can't scatter, grab it, and throw it back. So you count, they can now say, count by hundreds, 100, 200. You count by thousands, 1,000, 2,000. But see, the fear of getting killed by your own grenade is good enough that you want to throw it early. Now, when you start manufacturing grenades, the British grenade, the Mills bomb, should get a Mills bomb up here for you. The Mills bomb was actually had a had a timing mechanism on it that was about four and a half seconds. Now that should be plenty of time to release the item and throw it. But remember, and we'll come back to this when we're talking about the manufacturing process. Remember, they're trying to get rid of the shell shortage. One of the ways they're going to do this is by manufacturing very rapidly. In many cases, people are paid in factories to produce a certain number of shells at a certain length of time. If you do any more than that, you get paid more. It's like overtime. So you've done your consignment, whatever that was for that day. And this includes Mills bombs as well as shells. If you've made that consignment and you make some more, you make more money. So you have real incentive to do this fast. If you're not careful about quality control, and we're going to read about this the entire war, shells going off too early, artillery shells. Shells going off too late. And also there's the fear that the Mills bombs, see, if a shell goes off too early, that can kill your men. And we do read about this all the time. People killed by their own artillery. Some of that shells going off too early. Some of that is improper ranging by the, by the artillery. We'll, we'll, we'll have cause of talking about this in more than one <clears throat> scenario later on. 
but we are talking about hand grenades. So you're going to try to throw these over. Uh, this is an American hand grenade. It's not what's in use right now. I bought this at a gun show in Salt Lake City. They wanted $10 for it. Oh, come on. So I came back a few times, hoping it would go down to five. It never went down to five. They left it at 10. So I bought it for 10. Still think that's a little bit steep for this. Uh, in any event, you can see it's a dummy. It's, it's empty. There's nothing in it. So unless I drop this on my toe, there's no chance I'm going to get hurt. Notice it fits very nicely in your hand. It's pretty easy to hold. The Mills bombs are similar to this as well. These are fragmentation grenades. You can see by the serrations, I guess I should call it there, that when this explodes, these are supposed to fly off. And each one of those probably about the size of a bullet. Uh, what, it's about 50 of these? So you throw that out, that can do some considerable damage. If it lands close enough to a man, of course that can hit him several times. Uh, we'll, we certainly will probably kill him. Notice that the Mills bomb, a British manufactured bomb, is very similar. When you pull the pin, the pin does not start the fuse in here, the timing mechanism that will send it down to explode the item. All that does is make it so the spoon, which is right here, can be released. So you're holding the spoon in your hand. And if you release the spoon, like this, the spoon will pop up and the fuse will start. Then, if it's done properly, you have about four and a half seconds to make sure that thing is thrown far enough away that it won't hurt you or your friends. Sometimes you can just simply throw it, or you can release the spoon and then throw it. The most famous grenade in the First World War is actually the stick grenade, or also known as stick bombs. is this thing. Um, you can buy replicas of this. You can buy smaller versions. <clears throat> Sometimes during the Second World War, the Americans call these potato mashers. And actually, the Japanese did use this style grenade in the Second World War. So it's not just when the Americans had to fight the Germans in the Second World War, when the Americans were fighting the Japanese. Now, the Japanese and German are not exactly the same. You see down here, the way you start the mechanism is the fuse is here and it actually burns up inside of the stick to explode the item here. The way the Japanese would arm these in the Second World War, it was like striking a match. You would hit the head against something and sometimes the Japanese would just whack it against their knee, which I wouldn't recommend doing unless you want to hurt your knee. You whack it against the ground or, or stick or something like this and that would start the mechanism then you could throw it. Notice, now remember, this is a fragmentation grenade. This is not fragmentation. You see, we just simply have a, a bang. In other words, and we do have what we call offensive and defensive grenades in the First World War. Offensive grenades, like you throw in and you run into a trench. These tend not to be as powerful. Because if you go in there and you're just throwing in a grenade and you go in, it can kill you. You don't want your own grenade killing you. So they tend to have less power. A defensive grenade, if you're expecting the enemy to attack you, you want more powder in them because then you can throw at them as they come in, they get in a shell hole, you lob it in. You can put fragmentation, I don't think I have an example here. You can put fragmentation on these things, but this is really, really for bang effect. This will knock you around. It'll stun you, probably won't kill you, uh, but you'll be, shall we say, incapacitated. So, so why the use of a stick? The idea is you can throw a stick farther than you can, something in your hand. See, the lever action in throwing a hand grenade is literally the lever action in your, in your arm, in your hand. If you're a good baseball player, good football player, you have a pretty good idea that you can throw these, and you had a good arm, you can throw, throw these a pretty good distance. But if you have a stick in your hand, I don't have a stick to show you. If you have a stick in your hand, and remember the stick is in your hand, 
and the weight is up here, you, you tend to hold it down at, the, down at the bottom. Then when you throw that, the whipping effect, in other words, you have a little bit more inertia by throwing these things, so you can throw them a greater distance. That's the reason why you use a stick. I have read in one of the accounts that a guy with a good arm could throw these up to 80 or 90 yards. I'm going, you got to be kidding me. I was a baseball player growing up. I had a good arm, not a great arm. You know, the New York Yankees didn't come down and offer me a multi-million dollar contract to pitch for the Yankees. But I had a pretty good arm. I played outfield a lot. And so I, I, I could throw in and have a, have a lot of fun doing that. And however, I had got two brothers. And my brothers and I, um, you know, we throw things around. Well, way back when I was still in my 20s, when I still was had a lot more physical ability than I do now as an old man, my brothers, my two brothers, they're both six and eight years older than I am, we went out and saw how far we could throw a football. And we went out to a football field. So you're starting like on the end zone, and you chuck it and see how far it landed. I'm the kid with a pretty good arm. I could never, not even once, did I throw the ball much more than 40 yards. I'm a high school football fan. I go out and I watch high school football games. Some of these high school kids can throw it farther than that, 50, 60 yards. But I still want to see somebody take one of these things and throw them 80, 90 yards. I'm absolutely sure I could not do it. Of course, I can't try because I'm too old to try. So we're talking helmets, hand grenades, fragmentation devices. Oh, these, these uh, had a fuse about seven seconds, maybe slightly more than seven seconds. The idea you can throw and then it goes off, gives you what, seven seconds to cover 50 yards or whatever. Be, uh, when they go off and you can get in there. Uh, these are powerful enough that if you're in restricted space, it can kill you. We'll be talking about the Battle of Verdun shortly. There was one time at the Battle of Verdun, at the Battle of Fort, Fort Bull, when the Germans got inside, but they're trying to take, take the rooms. And one of the Germans got in front of his one of his big steel doors at Bull, and he put a hand grenade. I think it's one of these things in front of the door. Now, since it's not fragmentation, I'm not sure how much damage you actually do. But he had seven seconds to run out of the, uh, run out of the hallway, get out of the tunnel. And he didn't make it. And the concussion killed him. So he smashed his lungs and he's dead. So these, these things can be, shall we say, extremely lethal. Well, I mentioned trench raids. Um, going through no man's land. You're going to be out in no man's land much more, much more likely during the night than in the daytime. Obviously, in the daytime, you can be easily seen. Now, because the Western Front largely goes east to west, should we, it should say north to south, you're facing east to west. Let's look at the Western Front. World War I. Get my map up here. So I've showed you various configurations. Largely the map, map, largely the front is east to west. As you know, the sun comes up in the east. If the Germans aren't very careful, you can look over toward the French or British trenches and you can't see anything. But the earliest form of light will appear behind the Germans in the east. So there are times when the Germans apparently are thinking that they can't be seen. But when you take a look over here, in effect, the British and French can see you. So there's a reputation for the Germans and the French, I said that wrong, for the French and the British to see you and maybe knock a few of you guys off before you can get back inside your trenches. I already mentioned this horrific experience. What you accomplish, quite frankly, is not very much. Yeah, you do, you do keep the offensive spirit. Yeah, you do keep your guys moving around. Yeah, you're not just sitting in, in the trenches all the time. True of both the French and the Germans. But what are you really accomplishing by this? Extremely dangerous and many men are killed. You can light up what's happening outside. 
Now, as you know, that when you go to bed at night and you turn off the lights, everything looks pretty black. After what is about 20 minutes? After about 20 minutes, then your eyes have become accustomed to the darkness in the room. So you can see better. Like when you get up in the night and go to get a drink of water, whatever you happen to be doing, you can see around the house fairly well. But when you right turn the light, lights off, you can't. Sometimes when the men knew they were going out, you go into dugouts, you've got to get the instruction. And there's lights in the dugouts. So hopefully the enemy can't see the lights. You're in there and there's light in the room. Sometimes the guys are getting instruction. They get a patch, put a patch over their eye. So when they went outside, at least had one eye that was accustomed to seeing it seeing after dark. There's these little things to do which can make a difference. <clears throat> I mean, if you're out crawling around in no man's land, and if you make noise, <laughs> you, that, that's inviting the enemy to fire upon you. Sometimes when the guys go out, you're literally having a line of men, you're holding on to the guy's ankle in front of you. And sometimes you have a little, little, the guy in front, of course, is leading the group. And he'll have a twitch or something that will tell you, go to the left, go to the right, or retreat, or continue to advance. Uh, so you have these, these small kind of things to try to communicate with the other men in your group without making sound, without giving yourself away. Of course, what we see at night is flares. You shoot flares up. And the flares will shoot up. They're, they're rock. It's, it's, it's a little bit like fireworks. And they go up and usually they will light up. And it sounds like a puff, almost like an explosion. But the people shooting them up, both allies and Germans, you don't want to have this fall back to the ground. You want to have it illuminate the area for a while. So very often they would go up and have these things on small parachutes. So this burning ember, what do you want to call it, comes floating on down. So I forget how long it takes, number of seconds at least, for this thing to slowly settle on the ground. If you're out and you're on the ground, well, you just freeze. And when the light goes out, of course, that does something to your ability to see. If the flash hits your eyes, then suddenly you're going to have, suddenly everything looks dark again. And your eyes are going to have to readjust the darkness before you can see better. These things go up. I guess this is true. I read it. I guess it's true if you read it. And you're standing up. Your instinct is the light goes off to go down. Just boop, boop, I'm down the ground. However, if you move, they're more likely to see you. Movement catches your eye ever so much better than still. So the men tried. They tried to teach the men that when you're standing up, even in a cross position, whatever, one of these things go freeze. It's awfully hard to do when you have your enemy with high powered rifles and machine guns over there when he, with the easy range of killing you. You can see this is why I have a tendency to say how horrific this experience was. If you're in a trench, I should have mentioned this when I'm talking about helmets, when you're in a trench, you are taught to hit, you got in the field and you're under fire, you are taught to hit the ground. In a trench, hitting the ground is not a good idea. So essentially what you would do, you're wearing your helmet, of course. And if you hear a shell coming over, you jump against the side of the trench. If you go down, then your body's more exposed. But if you're standing up, this protects part of your body so you have a little less problem. Once again, under the circumstance, if you're out under fire, hitting the ground, ground, hitting the ground is a good idea. If you're in a trench, hitting the ground is a bad idea. So you have to train your mind, and you don't have time to think about this. You have to train your mind under which circumstance, what you're supposed to do. How do you survive? Well, I talked about if you're wounded and gassed, you're taken back, they patch you up and send you out. That's probably your best survival mechanism. But you have you have to try to survive and you're under constant death <clears throat> you see I should have mentioned this when we were talking about the French 75 and some of the other artillery pieces that have a flat trajectory they're firing 
faster than the speed of sound. The argument is you do not hear the one that kills you because the shell arrives before the sound does. Therefore, you have no, no chance to react. However, if it's a ways away, or if it's a howitzer and it has a higher trajectory, you can hear the sound before it comes in. Then you have the chance, the opportunity, what do you want to call it, to try to do something to survive. You jump, you go to the side. Or you get against the wall. There are other tactics. You do not want to sit, or sit. You do not want to hang near a machine gun. How is your enemy going to take out the machine gun? Among other ways, artillery fire. If you're hanging near a machine gun. No, no, no. Bad idea. So you hang away from machine guns. Something else we see in the First World War, we see mortars, trench mortars. And these things come up and get close. And <clears throat> I've already made a big deal about mortars, but they are also another ideal weapon for trench fighting. And you fire these things over. Well, how does your enemy take out the mortar, which is dropping a shell on top of you? Once again, with artillery. So there's another place where you do not want to be is next to an artillery, is next to a mortar, mortar position. Little things like this can increase, increase your chances. If you're very careful, you do increase your chances. But there's nothing you can do to make sure that you'll survive. And that somehow you get out of the trenches entirely. So you try to survive. Uh, I talked about enthusiasm. Men are well trained. And one of the things they're, they're very good at doing and training men for enthusiasm, you got to get out and do various things. And some of them are hepped up over national pride and patriotism, all these kind of things. That can keep enough momentum in the early couple of years of the war. In the late, later years of the war, the idea of patriotism and enthusiasm, uh, that really dwindles. And it's been demonstrated by a number of studies that really what these men were doing at this point is simply trying to survive rather than thinking in terms of patriotism. At the end of the First World War, a fascinating study was done. This is 1919. The war's only been over a number of months when some Germans went over and interviewed men who'd been in the trenches. What do you do? What do you think about when you're under bombardment? So for some reason, that, that kind of thing never rang a bell with me. Well, <laughs> you're gutting it out, right? How do you gut it out? You can be shelled sometimes for hours. Under extreme conditions, you can be shelled for days. How do you psychologically deal with that? Some of the men would tell jokes. Now, I being shell is very noisy. Shells boom, boom, boom. But of course, there's space between the shells. You got a good comedian? Good with one-liners? Well, if you have that ability and that mental capacity to, to continue to focus, you yell these out loud enough, some other guys can hear it. That, that, that can be a way that it can help you. Another thing you do is you think about home. If you have a picture, sometimes people pull out a photograph. And they think about their family and they think about home. That has a tendency to help you survive. In the brilliant German movie, Das Boot, it's about a German submarine in the Second World War. In one of the scenes, they're under a depth charge. Now, this, the motion picture is based on a novel written by a man who was a submariner during the Second World War, so he knew what he was talking about. Anyway, they're under depth charges, and any instant a depth charge can smash the whole of the vessel and you're all dead. Showed one man had a small photograph of Germany in snow or a hill or something like that, and, that, and during the depth charge attack he's looking at. That's not fiction. That's the kinds of things you try to do. Find a means of psychologically dealing with the situation. If it's thinking about something else, and you can do that, 
Yeah, that's very helpful. Psychological comfort. Your friends, your buddies. Reality is the man next to you. He can comfort you. He can help you. And if you cooperate with each other, he can help increase your chances of survival. We have something which we call PALS battalions coming from Britain. I think I mentioned this already. I'm repeating myself. Where you have guys in, in towns, you have guys in certain industries, you have guys in certain occupations that join together. So you've been friends a long time before you've actually been shown up. Of course, some of the closest bonds you're ever going to have as, as a man in friendship is with when you're in times of duress. Those of you who are athletes, this is both men and women out there, that, that you've been athletes, and I'm an old man, so I've been going to high school class reunions for a very lengthy period of time. Do you know who you who you talk with? You talk to everybody. You like all kinds of people. The the jerks don't come to reunions, but the, the, the nice guys do. You have a special bond after all these decades with people that you shared an athletic experience with. Wrestling team, baseball team, football team, doesn't matter. In a military situation, the bonds leave me closer. The friends help, but they also hurt. A friend can give you comfort, but what happens when he dies? You see, sometimes the psychological burden is so awful to watch a man die that sometimes it's not worth the risk to making new friends. One of the ways you keep up the strength in units, and while I got Remarque still on this thing, let me, let me, let me take another shot at him. In Remarque's novel, you have Kaczynski, Cat, who's looking over all these new guys coming in. It makes for pretty good fiction, but it's not really what was happening. You'd have units, and you'd have men who brought in as replacements. Therefore, the learning curve, curve was almost not there because the new guys can look around at the, at the band next to them and they learn very fast by copying what these guys are doing. Another distortion in Remark's book. So men are being brought up, this is virtually all armies, into existing units and the new guys come up. You don't know them. Sometimes it's so awful. The men come up and the other guys say, don't tell me your name. I don't want to know your name. Don't talk about yourself. I don't want to know. The reason being, they cannot stand to know you and then see you die. And that's what happens to many of their friends. Totally devastating. Well, how do you survive? Psychological comfort, yeah, tobacco. Tobacco has certain advantages. Nicotine is somewhat of an antidepressant. It will make you feel a little bit better. People who smoke, a lot of times they light up, they feel, they feel a high. They're not just taking care of a Nicky fit. They, they, they're hooked on it. Of course, they do get hooked on it. But you get something of a high. Something else tobacco will do is it takes away hunger pains. I, I knew a woman. I sister of a roommate I had back in the 70s. And she had gone off cigarettes and put on weight. So she went back on cigarettes to lose weight. Well, uh, I would think that's perhaps not the best thing to do. Uh, nonetheless, tobacco is something that people are get very, very interested in. Now, I have seen graphs, this is an American experience, of smoking rates in the United States. And essentially, during the First World War, the 19-teens, you see smoking rates go up. And then during the Second World War, you see smoking rates go up again. During the Second World War, the United States was actually promoting, the United States military was promoting the use of tobacco. You gave men cigarettes as part of the rations. The guys that didn't smoke would keep their, their cigs and give them to somebody else. See, one of the things they told you to do when your buddy gets hit before the, the medic can come up, give him a shot of morphine, put him on a stretcher and get him out of there, give him a cigarette. 
And you do see this in films all the time. Guy's hit, and one of his buddies pulls out a fag, lights it up, hands it to him. Now, there are a lot of reasons why smoking rates in the United States go up and remain high, one of which is the motion picture industry. And we do have a tendency to look at the motion picture industry as something that we should follow in clothing, in action. And if all these motion pictures, even before they had sound in the 1920s, and sound in the 1930s, 40s, way up, you see the man, the real man. He's got a cigarette. Boy, he's good looking. He's tough. And he wants to control the situation. You have women okay. looking feminine, sexy. Some of the more famous scenes in motion pictures where they light a cigarette. The man lights two cigarettes and he hands one to the woman and she takes a puff. It's sexy. It's cool. Good looking people do it. There's a lot of reasons why people turn to smoking. But one of the reasons is the military. There are certain advantages. Men do turn to tobacco. Sometimes men have not smoked before the war. They start smoking during the war. And very often they smoke after the war. Now, the medical community wasn't retarded. They knew. I mean, these guys that are pulling pieces out of a diseased lung out of men's chest clearly know that how damaging this can be to the body. It's not a secret. It's not until 1962 when the Surgeon General finally formally said to the American people, smoking can be dangerous to your health. I remember in magazines like Life magazine, which everybody, we all like magazines in the 50s. And our family took Life and Look and Saturday Evening Post. I remember seeing these ads where they actually had hired doctors, they're paying doctors to tell people it's healthy to smoke. The doctors knew better. But tobacco will get you through. If you're hungry, light, light up a cigarette. It'll take away your hunger pains. Alcohol, we'll talk more about that as we go along here because I'm going to talk about some more specific things here. But if you can get a hold of alcohol, and, and they, they issue actually alcohol as a ration. I, I mean, and talk about more of that in just a few minutes. But will that give you a chance to take away some of the agony, to take away some of the pain? And if you get drunk, that's not a good thing because then you don't function very well. And even a small amount of alcohol, if you have enough to have a buzz, you feel good. But that can actually inhibit your eye-hand coordination a little bit. Is it enough to be significant? Well, it's, the military leaders don't think so. So when you get a hold of alcohol, uh, a lot of times guys will try to smuggle alcohol at the trenches and, and take a hit. Looking back at um, the military going back way earlier than the First World War, we see this in the Civil War, we see this in earlier wars, where if a guy can get a hold of booze, my God, take a hit and <laughs> and takes you out of your agony, at least for a while. So alcohol becomes a factor. How about sex? Um, I had a very good friend who's a Vietnam War veteran. Yeah, he's psychologically disturbed from his experiences, but that didn't, didn't mean that he said that um, um, that what he said was always inaccurate. Sometimes I think he, he was delusional. But he said there's three ways you got through Vietnam. Sex, drugs, and insanity. He said, I did all three. Well, he didn't throw in tobacco. I don't think he smoked. But can we say alcohol, sex, and insanity? It's one of the good ways to get through. Well, let's throw in tobacco. Tobacco, alcohol, sex, insanity. Anything you can do for comfort. Going back to my friend's discussion, he said there were moralists, and these men are admirable. The guys don't even swear. You get them over in the train over over in Vietnam. They're trying to keep up their dignity. Okay. They, they, they're, they're trying not to smoke, trying not to get drunk, they're trying not to get on alcohol. He said that wrong. Trying not, not to get on drugs, get on marijuana, or harder drugs, which tended to be available in Vietnam or go to women. 
And his opinion was this, that this actually made it harder for these men because they're actually fighting two battles. They're fighting battles against the kinds of things that might comfort them. Now, if you're a moralist, you look at these kind of things and say, this is immoral. You should refrain from these kind of things. But if you get something, some kind of easing of your pain, easing of your agony, just something, that can, that can be somewhat helpful. Of course, young men are the way young men are. <clears throat> I don't know how you got here, but the reason why I got here is my dad liked my mother. How do I know that? Well, the fact that I'm here does give you an indication. When dad was in the army during the Second World War, mom and dad literally wrote to each other every day. Dad would actually say things in his letters uh, that he's writing after they actually turned the lights off in the barracks. So he's, he's going he's to keep writing. I'll come to letters in just one minute as well. Now, there's nothing more sick than to think your parents liked each other. So if you want to read your parents' letters, be very careful. Be prepared. There's nothing sicker than think you think that your uh, parents liked each other. And I remember, I care his mom or dad, they're saying, I like the way you kiss. Oh, no, 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 please, please, please don't do that to me. I, I can't take this. Barracks talk. The guys are talking in the barracks during the Second World War. The war's still on. And dad actually put this in one of the letters. Now, my dad was a prude. Th th this guy was really a prude. He didn't drink, swear, smoke, chew. <laughs> he never said a bad word. You know, darn was outside of his vocabulary. For him to say something like this in a letter, I said, was, shall we say, stepping outside of his uh, personality quite a bit. Anyway, he said the guys are talking in the barracks, and you know, the guys talk about anything, including sex. And he said, one of the guys said to him, he says, you know something, when I go home, the only thing my wife is going to see for the first two weeks is the ceiling. Obviously, he's very interested. Well, men are interested in this kind of thing. And yes, but sometimes it's just contact comfort. You're being next to somebody, somebody warm. And if she's nice, she's compassionate. If not, well, you're still next to somebody. Letters. Letters are a big comfort to a lot of people. I'm totally lost in where I'm at. So let's see where we're we doing as far as time is concerned. Oh, my goodness. Have I ever talked too much? Well, I do apologize for that. Uh, I want to get into letters a little bit more. I want to talk about that to some extent. But as we're speaking, I'm running out of time. I will come back and revisit this. In the meantime, have a great day and enjoy. And we will continue with this, this next time. Remember, this is Lecture 16.